the Lord is so kind that he has spread the river Ganges throughout the universe so that by taking a bath in that holy river, everyone can get released from the reactions of sins which occur at every step. The Bhagavata. Welcome to Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I am your host. I'd like to thank everyone for joining me this week. Uh, if you're a new listener, welcome. Uh, I hope that you'll be pleased with the show and uh, you'll go back and listen to new episodes and, or I'm sorry, go back and listen to some old episodes and you keep listening for the new ones. Uh, and of course, for my longtime listeners, as always, thank you. Or even people who have only been listening for a week or two. <laughs> um, so, uh, it seems like the last episode was very well received. I had a lot of... Uh, a lot more than normal day one downloads most of the time it's fairly well spread out through the week Um, but uh, I was really pleased uh, with the last episode and uh, the months are already off to a very good start so thank you all uh, for listening and sharing Uh, I of course have been uploading my backlog up onto YouTube Uh, that seems like it's going pretty well too Um, if you you know if you're interested I include the links in the episode descriptions uh, you can find it there as well. Although again, we're still uh, we're still a few episodes back. Um, I think right now I'm working on uploading a few more this week, uh, and they're basically starting uh, with the Hindu Kush episode uh, from wow, is that already two months ago? It feels like, but um, yeah. So uh, feel free to keep listening wherever you'd like. Uh, but if you do happen to be on YouTube, drop by leave a subscription and a like and all that on whatever videos you can find. All right. For now, though, let's go ahead and get into the reason we're all here. Good old history or archaeology, at the very least. Uh, So this week we're heading back uh, north um, or to the northern part of South Asia. Um, Specifically, we will be focusing on developments happening Uh, two peoples living in the Ganges water system. Uh, This is to the east of the Indus sites and to the north of the, uh, of course, still mobile and decentralized hunting and gathering groups of the Deccan and Sri Lanka. Um, There is a vast plain between the Indus River system and the Ganges system, and it is an extremely fertile region due to being connected to one of or both of these river systems uh, that receive runoff from the Himalayan mountains or from, of course, seasonal rains and monsoons. Um, In some cases, these, I guess the uh, Indic uh, Gagnatic Plain is a term sometimes used, like it's considered a one water system by some people. However you want to think about it, you're you're welcome to do so. I'm not an environmentalist. I'm not a geologist. Um, I I can't really speak definitively. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, at least culturally, uh, these two regions, though they are connected, they have different uh, environments, and that has given rise to different aspects of uh, human civilization in the region. Though there is a lot of similarities, they each have their own kind of local flair and flavor and uh, priorities, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term. Um, Now, as you travel from east to west, uh, say, from the Indus uh, River um, area, uh, traveling towards uh, the Ganges and uh, what is modern-day northeast India and Bangladesh before you get to Southeast Asia, uh, you're, you're, you're seeing a lot of um, changes uh, from the foliage and the wildlife. Uh, and this is true now. It's true at our time period that we're focusing on, 8,000 to 6,000 BC. Um, in the west toward the Indus at the eight to 6,000 BC mark, it was probably greener with more trees, uh, slightly larger and of course, you have your your bushes and shrubs and that that kind of thing, um, with some stretches and pockets of just what is dry, kind of really thin grass and shrublands. But as you move to the east, you see more forests, 
and there are similar and and these are kind of similar to the forest between the Aravalli and Ventias uh, mountains and the Deccan Peninsula or at least the central part of the Deccan Peninsula. Uh, these are categorized again as dry deciduous forests so they see a lot of rain for a quarter of the year or so but very little for the rest of the year so they have a very heavy rainy season the rest it's very dry. Now at the period of time we're focusing on that's probably not exactly how the rain situation is. Uh, they're probably seeing a little bit better or more even distribution during the year or a longer rainy season at least. Um, so it m may be closer to what exists in modern Northeast India and Bangladesh, uh, the, the period or the place that we're focusing on now. So the East may have been slightly closer to uh, the West. Um, now these forests in the East and Bangladesh, Northeast India, they're mostly considered um, moist deciduous forests. These kind of see the opposite precipitation. They see rainfall um, somewhere between a thousand and two thousand millimeters uh, of rain during the year, uh, but they do have a short dry season. So uh, there is a similarity to plant and animal life between the two regions, um, but there is also, you know, probably more differences just due to the amount of water that they see. Uh, the trees, they may be the same species or at least cousin species, but you'll see that they get much taller uh, in the east. Um, now, I briefly touched on some of the difficulties that arche archaeological studies face uh, with some environments, I think a, an episode or two ago. Hotter loca locations typically don't preserve organic material well. Uh, though things like stone, bone, wood tools, you know, they're, they're less affected. Uh, and there are certain things that can preserve uh, organic material, uh, at least when it comes to deserts. Of course, you have uh, people who use them for flash mummification. We'll talk about that when we get back to Africa uh, in the future. Um, but for the most part, hotter locations are not great for things like skin or flesh. Now humid and wet environments have this problem as well, but they accelerate the process and can cause more wear to wood, stone, and bone. Uh, and when you get to places like forests and rainforests especially, um, the soil is very acidic. Um, this is done you know, by the foliage because this makes things decompose quicker to make sure like nutrients and all that kind of stuff are returned to the earth so that it can be used to fill the living growth. Now this acidity affects everything, organic stones, bones, wood, all that stuff. Um, I think the only exception in some cases are certain types of metals. So parts of the Deccan and where we will be focusing on for the next few episodes not just this part of India, but also Southeast Asia. Um, this, you know, they all they share all of these environmental traits. So it's probably one of the reasons why we have less artifacts to search, or I'm sorry, less um, artifacts and remains to study. Um, now, obviously, there are again factors that can mitigate this, so we aren't completely without. Uh, things to look at, but it means we have to make jumps and conclusions based on much more limited sets of data. Now, uh, like the Deccan, there are no known examples of uh, proto-urbanization of this region dating to our current time frame. Uh, there are, however, a number of ancient sites that were in continuous use by traditional hunter-gatherer groups, some of which will be sites for, um, you know, late, I guess, uh, Neolithic sites, um, things like stone shelters or rock shelters, um, campgrounds, things like that. And some of them 
or even you know become sites for permanent uh, habitats or, or proto cities or villages, you know things like that. Um, but of course, due to the challenges that the environment poses to you know the archaeological record, it's hard to date these things with a thousand percent certainty. Uh, so we may be kind of guessing a little short on how old things are. Uh, but we can make, you know, reasonable assumptions based on what has and can be firmly dated and what we know is happening in the surrounding areas. And I'm going to try and get into what we can reasonably assume about this region. So they are obviously uh, living again the nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle but they are probably not completely ignorant or dismissive of agriculture either uh, again these people are making you know fairly regular trips uh, between locations like in their general vicinity they have contact with other mobile groups as well as their sedentary neighbors to the uh, west and they also have groups further to the east outside of modern day I guess we'll call it uh, continue calling it South Asia of course when you cross over to Southeast Asia now this is not necessarily large scale in any one direction this could just be like a few smaller groups that are basically acting as intermediaries between their hunter-gatherer brethren and these emerging uh, sedentary groups or you know even the groups to the north because there are some groups in the Tibetan plateau that may be doing kind of the same sedentary work as well we'll, we'll get into the discussion on that later um, but uh, there are a number of things that we know about tribal groups that live in India and Bangladesh even today. I mentioned how the Dakan still has areas where there's a large portion of, um, I think India calls them today, scheduled tribes uh, that still, you know, live in these small mobile or mobile-ish communities. They're slightly less mobile today. Part of that's due to, you know, the state and cities and towns just everyone, of course, trying to force people to urbanize, essentially. Um, not because they necessarily have problems with um, mobile groups, although there are, I'm sure, some that would consider that those people problematic. Um, but there's always this, there's always going to be this undercurrent going forward. As cities become more prevalent, there's always going to be this big disconnect between uh, the city and the city-state and of course later nation-states and uh, regional empires you know there's always going to be this disconnect between their your mobile and their immobile citizens and neighbors um, but the the mobile groups that lived in India today and their immediate predecessors uh, practice a form of slash and burn agriculture you know they move from um, location to location every so often uh, they'll get to an area where the forest has kind of reclaimed uh, the fallow land that they had left behind they will cut down the wood and the trees use all that kind of stuff to you know create new tools or equipment or you know art or anything everything that they can use it for and then they will use that freshly burnt out and cut down uh, land to grow crops on um, now at our timeline there's not a lot of evidence that they were causing huge swaths of the forest to be uh, destroyed um, or harvested for purposes though i'm sure that they were doing that because they needed the material wood is a constant need uh, things to burn fuels for fire again this is one of the big struggles that humans have faced 
for most of the history, heating, uh, especially uh, during rain and windy uh, and dark nights. Um, excuse me, I kind of messed up my train of thought like halfway through that sentence, sorry. Um, but uh, they're probably, you know, at this point, they are probably aware definitely of groups to their uh, west practicing, you know, beginnings of large-scale agriculture uh, with things like wheat and barley. Uh, and they have their neighbors to the east and to the northeast. Um, and they are probably beginning to um, receive uh, rice uh, as, you know, something in trade. Um, and rice is very important for Eastern Indian and Southern Indian uh, diets and cooking. Um, and it's probably around this period that these strains are entering into uh, the subcontinent. And they're probably, you know, planting them as they're moving and traveling along these rivers. And there are a lot of rivers to travel through. Um, the Ganges Plain has so many just different tributaries coming down from the Himalayas. It's more than out to the um, west. Uh, in fact, I think some of them today have probably dried up, but nowhere near to the, you know, the kind of dry up that they're experiencing in the west. Um, and again, we're, we'll cover all that kind of stuff later. Um, sorry, I'm going through my notes here. Uh, just making sure. So uh, there is a debate about where rice was first domesticated. I'm not going to dive into that in this episode. Um, I will go into specifics in our next domestication specials. Uh, but... Wherever it was exactly uh, domesticated first, or at least, you know, that, that slow process that we've talked about of practicing horticulture, you know, clearing out certain crops, you know, not controlling it directly, maybe just trying to help it along and let it still be wild. Um, wherever it did start, uh, it's probably at this point in time, like right, right in the middle of our period. 8,000 to 6,000, maybe closer to the 8,000 mark, that rice is beginning to be cultivated in a large amount um, by whoever, you know, whoever started it. And again, I'll be into that later. Uh, it's probably happening in India at this point in time. Uh, and there are other wild uh, vegetables and fruits that are uh, important to this region and that will make it important. Uh, I mentioned pepper and things like that in the last episode for uh, South India. Uh, in this part of India, uh, you have a lot of wild fruits. Um, while lemons came from the uh, south of the Deccan, uh, I believe that you have, um, in this region, you have mangoes. Uh, Mango is a very important uh, crop in India. Even today, I think they're still the leading exporter in the entire world. Uh, I think star fruits are also from this region initially, um, at least as far as we can tell. Um, and India is going to be successful uh, growing that, or at least these mobile farmers will be successful growing it, and then later... You know, centralized polities will be successful growing it. And then, of course, you become, or you see a numerous um, collection of city-states, uh, kingdoms become even more successful and they spread out and then they meet their neighbors to the south and to the uh, west. And those larger states that eventually become uh, part of the British Empire and then later unified India become successful in growing rice. Uh, but it, it, the, the subcontinent itself is, or at least the eastern and southern half of the continent, are very well suited to growing rice. And they, they are so successful at it, they make their, their own strain. Uh, whether or not, again, whether there is debate about 
uh, if rice emerged uh, in India or if it was brought to and then expanded uh, into the region. Uh, I'll get into more in our next domestication specials. Uh, but there is a variety of rice that is specifically named after India um, that I think is still the primary one grown in the rest of the world. Um, I have to recheck my notes, but uh, India is well suited to agriculture and the east and the south, especially with these large uh, river basins. Uh, but that is also, of course, not the only uh, you know reason that people live there. Um, again, you have this disconnect between the mobile groups and the sedentary groups later. Uh, but at this point in time, you know, the mobile groups, they probably aren't having to move too far, uh, too often. Um, and the region is very populated uh, today. And I think that that's something that was probably the case uh, even earlier. Um, they may not be living in these large bands, but I do think that they're probably living in what are what we would consider a village. Um, while these groups to the west are probably you know, making these large scale uh, proto cities, they are just living in these smaller uh, smaller communities, things made from simple you know wood or um, possibly kind of uh, mud. Uh, dried mud uh, brick huts, things like that. And it, that's probably why we don't have too much of the ar in the archaeological record because they're made, their houses and their dwellings and storage areas were just made from simple material that is meant to be reclaimed. Uh, it probably was useful to them to not have anything permanent because they want the forest and the environment to grow back quickly. Uh, it helps their lifestyle, something that they obviously have a long tradition with. It, again, it lasts even until today, uh, though these uh, tribal groups are in smaller and smaller numbers every year. Uh, so you have highly mobile groups, although um, I should say that they have the capability to be high, highly mobile. They may not be moving all that much at this point in time. Uh, the environment's probably really good for them. Uh, even if they're not practicing full-scale agriculture, it's only small seasonal farms or like wild farms, I guess might be the best term for them. There's still a lot of biodiversity and animals to hunt. Um, the Ganges itself is home to a number of different species uh, today. Uh, like in terms of fish, I think there's over like a hundred varieties that humans can eat. There are turtles, uh, which humans all over are enjoying having a meal on a turtle. Um, you have, uh, you do have fearsome predators that you'd have to deal with, things like tigers. Uh, there's the, I forget the term, but it's like gaharl or gahul. It's like a crocodile, um, or it's relative to a crocodile. They have those very narrow like snouts uh, that they're having to deal with. Um, there are freshwater dolphins in the Ganges. In fact, there's some in the, in the Indus too. I neglected to mention those now that I think about it. Um, but they, uh, those, uh, the ones in the Indus River system, the one in the Ganges system, they are a different separate species. Uh, I think they're one of only five uh, river, like true freshwater dolphin species that we are aware of, even historically. Um, I think the one in China has gone extinct recently. I think they now believe that that's an extinct species. Uh, there's the one in the Amazon, and there is one more uh, that I cannot remember. It's in South America, but I can't remember specifically where it is. But um, yeah, so. Hunting is still very viable, uh, and this, what they're hunting in this region is, again, it's unique. It is something that could probably only be found there. So, with a mix of um, uh, their local animals and plants and wild fruits, um, they have a very attractive, or at least an exotic, base of goods to form 
uh, trade networks with the peoples to their east uh, and to their west, as well as uh, whatever groups may be living to the south or north, which again, uh, we'll, we'll go into a little bit more detail on the northern groups later. It's not an easy journey. Uh, the Himalayas are not uh, easy to cross, even if you have a way through. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that later. And these groups were probably some of the ones um, that are inhabiting the Deccan, or at least relatives of the groups uh, inhabiting the Deccan. It's much easier to get to South India uh, through the Eastern Ghats than the Western Ghats, I believe. The Eastern Ghats, um, while they're, I think they're about as long as the Western Ghats, their peaks are not quite as well connected. There are more hilly lands through them as opposed to just solid rock. Um, and there is a much, there is a slightly a small desert between where the Eastern Ghats end and the, I guess, the, the emergence of the Ganges River system into the Bay of Bengal. Uh, but it's, it's a lot smaller than the Thar Desert is to the west. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that desert in the future. Uh, it's not really important. There's no archaeological information uh, that I've been able to find even mentioning that desert until le much later. Um, but yeah, so the the people living here, you know, they are, they're still in a, you know, pretty, uh, honestly, a very nice place. This is probably a, a, almost a utopia <laughs> to some extent for a hunter-gatherer uh, lifestyle, or is at least as close as a utopia it, as a hunter-gatherer lifestyle can be. Um, there's plenty of things to eat, um, you know, year round, even during a, a quote unquote dry season, they could probably just move down the coast or they could move, uh, further west or, you know, maybe they'd just be hunting animals at that point instead of mostly gathering. Um, it's hard to say, um. But and this this is a region that's hard that it's probably hard for outsiders to acclimate to, which is probably why you have these kind of large scale um, tribes last for as long as they did. Um, it's not easy for you know city dwellers to kind of get out and just cut through all this deep vegetation. And as you go further east and into Southeast Asia and uh, the eastern part of India and Bangladesh, you're getting into more and more water, like true tropical rainforest. There, it's always raining, um, and always, you know, it's always hard to get through. So, uh, but that is probably why um, you will see, much like their uh, neighbors to the uh, west of India, become great sailors. The sailors in the east. Uh, take do spread there as well. Uh, although I believe that it's a lot harder to sail kind of in the Bay of, Bay of Bengal uh, just due to the nature of the weather there. Um, but that's something that we'll talk about in the future. Um, so uh, I think that kind of covers the highlights. Again, I'm sorry there's not much to go on. Uh, from what I can see in the archaeological record, there is no real city in um, this part of India until I think right now the current time frame is like 1500 uh, uh, BCE is the is the current earliest date that a city is known to have exist and even that is up for debate i think at one point it was considered um they didn't think it had started until the the i want to say it's the um the 800s bc and that's the city of varanasi varanasi um but again they did more excavation work and they've determined it's quite a bit older than that at least seven centuries older um and i'm i'm fully convinced that you know when they start to um study more that they will you know find older settlements though i doubt they're going to find anything 
quite as old as what we're talking about. Um, so yeah, sorry, I was I was trying to think. I just had another thought, and I didn't have it in my notes uh, about the agriculture. Um, also, one reason that it's probably uh, rice is probably more favored in this part of the subcontinent as opposed to wheat and barley. Um, the ground and the uh, trees, fire is important for clearing them away because they're obviously not using metal at this point in time. Uh, there's only so much you can do with stone and wood, but of course in these deep, like strong, tropical settings, um, there's only so much you can do with stone and wood tools to kind of get these gone stone mostly for trees wood awls and like plows and things like that that you would use to kind of till the soil that's used all over the world first before they start working on stone and then later metal which of course makes it easier to um, plow these thicker heavier soils and um, uh, places so that's Another reason why you don't see large-scale habitation until later, just because the tools are not available to help. So rice is a little bit easier to cultivate, um, or at least plant, I should say. There, It has its own challenges, separate from barley and wheat. Uh, but again, I'm going to go into that. Uh, but that's a, probably another reason that you don't see large-scale um, sites in the area, because the technology is not available to anyone. Um, either locally or, you know, in their neighborhoods to the west, south, or east uh, for, you know, these large-scale cities to be supported. Uh, at most, you're probably looking at a couple hundred people at max. Uh, and then from there, you know, you'd probably break off and have smaller, smaller groups once you got to that point. Um, but I have a feeling that there were quite a large number of those groups, um, just because of the population density there today. Um, and rice uh, expansion is going to help that population grow even more. Um, but yeah, I think that's um, that's kind of the main stuff. Um, oh, etymologically speaking, I did not really go over too much when it comes to the Ganges. Um, Again, the Ganges is a very long river. It's got a ton of tributaries. Um, I'll probably go into a lot more detail on those as time goes on. Um, also, but once the once the Ganges reaches into what is now Bangladesh, uh, it's referred to as the Padma uh, because that's where it changes direction and it's getting um, it's getting uh, rivers from like a different source come into it. Things from um, uh, what is now Myanmar and uh, uh, Bhutan. Uh, whereas the Ganges is getting its uh, sources from uh, what is now uh, Nepal, Tibet, uh, and the, the uh, west. Um, Padma is where the Ganges in the east meets. I believe it's the Brahmaputra in the in the, I'm sorry, the Gan yeah, the Ganges in the west, the Brahmaputra in the east, and where they come together, uh, that kind of forms what is the, I guess, the Padma branch of the uh, Ganges Delta. Um, now, uh, the etymology of the Ganges itself uh, comes from uh, the name uh, Ganga, who is the, the Sanskrit goddess, or I'm sorry, the Hindu goddess, um, uh, she, like uh, the Sarasvati River, she is the personification of this river. She she is the deity of that river. Um, she's very important religiously uh, because, uh, as my quote at the start of the episode, uh, the Ganges is kind of the river that you go to, um, and you you know you're blessed, you're forgiven for your sins. You know it, it it's a purifying river. Um, it's very important um, to uh, not just um, Hindu uh, cultures in terms of uh, religion, but I believe also um, the Buddha uh, did several like famous uh, sermons there. 
uh, I think a couple of the um, early Buddhist um, uh, holy sites, temples are right along the, the Ganges as well. Um, it's a very important religious um, feature. Uh, not even getting into the um, ecological <laughs> importance of the river, which cannot be outstated. Um, I think there's a lot of worry today about certain parts of the Ganges drying up. Um, I know there was a big issue, I think it was in the early 2000s. I think it has for the most part rebounded, though there are some smaller arms that have dried up. Um, thankfully, there hasn't been too much in terms of conflict between India and Bangladesh. Um, which again, we're, we're going to get into all that kind of stuff later. I think they've been able to mostly negotiate uh, reasonably peacefully and without too much you know, saber rattling from either side about how to share the river. Um, but yeah, so I, I don't know the etymology of um, Ganga herself. Um, she's a very important goddess. Um, she... Well, we'll study Hindu religion later, but yes, it's an important river, uh, very important, uh, probably the most important. Uh, so uh, whatever the reason for her name or however it came about, um, you know, just know that the river got the name from the goddess. Where the goddess name comes from, I'm not sure. Um, I will try to find out. But uh, yeah, uh, I'd like to thank you all for listening. I know that it might be a little frustrating to not have too much firm evidence to talk about. Uh, I hope I explained reasonably well why we're probably not seeing too much of that uh, from the last two or three episodes and why it might be a little rough in Southeast Asia. Um, when we get up to China, we're going to have a little bit more concrete stuff to talk about. Uh, but I, I would keep an eye if you're interested in this kind of stuff, which if you're listening to this show, you obviously are. Um, there's been an expansion of Indian like archaeological studies like internal to them, and they, they of course, can still invite outsiders to help out. Um, so, you know, we're learning new stuff all the time. It wouldn't surprise me again if we find more and more artifacts from earlier periods than what we know now. Um but, you know, if anything major comes up, I'll be sure to, to bring it up in, you know, an episode. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think this has been a good little episode, almost 40 minutes. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for listening. Um, please feel free to give me any feedback. Um, you can email me at war at revpod at gmail.com. You can direct message me on Twitter, my um, DMs are open. You can leave a comment on any of my videos on YouTube, uh, and I will get back with you there. Um, but yeah, thank you all for joining me. I hope you've enjoyed. Uh, if you, uh, you know, again, any questions, comments, uh, I, I'm all about the constructive criticism and feedback, and I, I am trying to make the show better. And um, I'm glad that so many people seem to be liking it and uh i'm having a lot of fun making it so thank you all i hope you have a good rest of your day and a good rest of your weekend and your week goodbye